All right. Hello, folks. I hope you can hear me well. I'm having problems, microphone problems, so I'm having to uh, talk with this headset on, something I don't like a whole lot. All right, kids, here we go. I'm going to give some thoughts on Mike Tyson versus that Paul boy. And I'm going to give some thoughts, since it's been in the news lately, on people like Bruce Lee, Gene LaBelle, uh, the other fat guy that does Tai Chi. And maybe we'll talk about a few other things along the way. Uh, this is really for you younger folks. Uh, oh, and wrestling, wrestlers. And that's what we're going to lead in. Well, I'm going to lead in with the Paul uh, Mike Tyson fight. And then we're going to go into when I was a kid and when I found out who who were the real tough guys, who, who really were the real tough guys. So here goes. Um, Tyson and Paul. That's in July. I don't know why I'd be talking about it this early. It's a good long way off and... Uh, it's not that important, really. Uh, but it's fun for Mike Tyson fans that will be able to get to see Mike. And uh, as a big Mike Tyson fan <clears throat> from the start myself, uh, I was well into adulthood when Mike came along. It was refreshing for boxing. Uh, although previous to him, we did have some great boxing with Larry Holmes, who just literally beat up every, all comers. All right. <clears throat> and then I lived Ali, I mean, Frazier, Foreman, Liston, all, the, all that. So I've got to see uh, a lot of good boxing when it happened. Uh a lot more than a lot of people. And I used to sit and listen to the old timers talk about seeing Joe Lewis and uh, Rocky Marciano and all these guys. Uh, even met people that had uh, uh, heard on the radio uh, Jack Dempsey or went to one of his fights. So, uh, I think this fight's just, it's just going to be an exhibition. Uh, it's going to be no more, no less than when Tyson uh, had the exhibition against Roy Jones Jr. It's basically going to be a tit for tat exhibition, which is not a real full force fight. Uh, I seen where Rich, the fight historian, had put a video out and said, well, what if it gets real? What if they, there's a low blow or if something happens and they get angered and start tussling? If they get angered and start tussling, <clears throat> Paul's going to literally drop Tyson. Uh well, why, why are you talking about? Uh, Tyson's going to be 58 years old when this fight takes place. Uh, what you're seeing with Mike Tyson and what Mike Tyson is putting out uh, in these little snippets are not Mike Tyson. Uh, these are 15, 20 second snippets that are taken uh, the best of the best out of a training session, uh, which I will say a lot of times, uh, w well, we really don't do because uh, 
well, with Joe, I just really show reflex bag work. I don't show too much more else of what we do. On occasion, I do. Uh, but Joe will do rounds on that reflex bag, and I just hit the start button. And tip is sometimes I hit it when he's doing really well, and sometimes I just hit it and say, we're going to go with that, and that's the video we're going to put out. Uh, hence the big ups and downs. And then sometimes maybe he's not feeling well and it doesn't do real good. And sometimes it goes in there. He's spot on. I click the record button right at the right time and we get some great, great footage. Uh, and that's the real Joe. Uh, but, and if it turns into a, a somebody gets upset, something happens and it turns into a, a real dog fight unless Mike hits him with a overhand right uh, Mike's not going to be able to do anything with him it's the physics and the age part of it and I look at how I age and uh, uh, up till I was 51 50, 51 or 52 I was putting videos out of myself and uh Pridefully, I'll tell you, I looked damn good, and I was always a hard hitter, and uh, was taught to hit hard. Uh, I'm not sure I was naturally born with the ability to hit hard, and I hear a lot of these guys like Atlas say, well, you're either born with it, or you're not, and there's nothing you can do, nothing can be further from the truth with that. Everything's about leverage. I don't know why At Teddy Atlas fall people would be one of those that would say you're either born with it or, or you're not, and that's it. Because <clears throat> being under Diamato and all that, uh, he knows better than that. It's you can. It's physics. All right. So I don't think I wouldn't purchase the fight. I'll be excited to watch it later on YouTube, but. It's just going to be a, an exhibition, a play fight. <coughs> We've had a lot of them. They used to put them on TV. Uh, for example, Muhammad Ali uh, fought in an exhibition against Lyle Alzado, who decided he wanted to retire from football. And uh, this was a bad dude and become a uh, pro boxer. And Muhammad Ali just... Uh, Alzado was really trying the best he could, and Ali was just playing around with him. And, uh, uh, you know, we've had a lot of exhibitions. Uh, we've, we've had uh, a forgotten uh, exhibition type thing with Muhammad Ali that's really hilarious. Uh, Muhammad Ali goes into what was called at that time. Uh, an area, maybe in Allentown, Pennsylvania, maybe it was when he was in New York. Uh, Muhammad Ali liked wrestling. That's where he got the idea to be the Louisville Lip and be so boisterous and things like that, uh, which was an exciting part to Muhammad Ali. Uh, Ali fought Gorilla Monsoon and you should all look that up because it's very interesting. It's funny, too. Uh, Ali jumps up in the ring. Gorilla Monsoon at the time is a bad guy. His character is a bad guy. And Ali goes up there, slings a few punches at him. Uh, Gorilla Monsoon gets him up on his shoulders and puts him in the airplane spin dumps him down on the mat and Ali's oh, like he's real dizzy and all grabs his shoes and his shirt and whatever he took off and his overcoat and is heading out of there as he's yelling at Gorilla Monsoon it's just hilarious it's funny uh, but if it turned into a real dog fight as much as I dislike these Paul boys, uh, and I do, uh, he's 27 years old, he's a big guy, and uh, he'd be able to jump around. 
uh, and just take Mike into deep waters and drown him. It's what you do. It's what boxers do to any to, to folks that don't box. Uh, it's what Joe has repeatedly done where we've gotten big, big 230 or 40 pound uh, men to come in and spar with Joe and Joe will just toy, move around and take them into exhaustion and start hitting them till they quit and they quit. Uh, it's not a news flash. Any really, really good young boxer or adult would do that. Uh, it's nothing extraordinary about it, at least from where I'm sitting. Uh, next thing I want to talk about here is after my, you know, I started this out with 10 minutes of boring. This is going to get a little more interesting, I believe, uh, for you guys. Um, I want to talk about wrestling and boxing. And when I say wrestling, I don't mean like NCAA wrestling. I'm talking about professional wrestling, fake wrestling, phony wrestling, predetermined winner wrestling. Uh, wrestlers are pretty good athletes, uh, some of them, uh, some of them not. Uh, I do, I, I, and I don't want to necessarily just dead dog wrestling. Uh, but we're talking about this in comparison to boxing or MMA or true combat sport, real combat sport. Uh, <clears throat> when I was a young man, uh, my uncle at the time was working in Hollywood. Uh, he resided in, lived in Van Nuys, California. He was a former major league baseball player. Uh, he was friends with a guy that most of you may not know, but had a very popular TV show, Chuck Connors. And the show was called The Rifleman. And they were, those two, these two guys were thick as thieves. And after my uncle Bud Harden's uh, baseball career, uh, Chuck Connors got him into working in Hollywood. Uh, my uncle worked on a lot of TV shows. Um, he worked on Dallas, uh, the TV show Dallas, which was a huge show uh, back in its day. He worked on a television show called Chips, which was uh, about the California Highway Patrol. Uh, he worked on episode, episodes of the Twilight Zone, uh, uh, which was a old science fiction weekly hourly show that came on uh, during the late 50s, mid 60s, I believe. Uh, and, a, and a lot of other shows that I can't even remember off the top of my head. And he worked in a lot of uh, movies as well. And he was in some of the episodes of some of the shows that he worked on. Uh, I believe it was one, one of the, maybe it was one of the Twilight Zone movies or one of the crime show, uh, not Twilight Zone television shows or maybe it was one of the crime series television shows that he worked on and it was they had it was about baseball players and he got to be one of the baseball players in there so uh he's a very interesting guy he knew the ins and outs of professional a athletics and hollywood and put on and all that uh, I could sit for two hours and tell you stories about him. He uh, met Marilyn Monroe several times. Uh, they met, met everybody. But <clears throat> I was a younger guy. We're talking mid to late 70s. I was a teenager. Uh, and uh, I got really big into wrestling. And wrestling was... For us, uh, from, 
from where I lived was home based in Charlotte, North Carolina, and the wrestling was Jim Crockett Promotions, and it was uh, called Minute Mid Atlantic Wrestling. <clears throat> it ended up being WCW. Uh, the Crockett's sold the company to Ted Turner, and it ended up being WCW. Uh, some years later. But point being, I was, uh, at the time I'm going to talk about here, uh, when football season uh, wasn't in play, uh, there were two places you could catch me at. And that would be in the, at the boxing gym or the taekwondo Institute, I believe it was called. Um, the Taekwondo guy was, uh, he was something else. He was a former four-time uh, Korean and three-time world Taekwondo champion. So he was very important in the Taekwondo and martial arts community. He was, he was a well-known guy. Uh <clears throat> So I'd be there, and I'd be at the boxing gym. And at the boxing gym, a, a lot of you have heard me talk about several people. Uh, one of the gentlemen, I'm going to try to get some people to come forward online, and I'm going to figure out uh, the last names of the two gentlemen that worked most with me. But on occasion, we had Ace Miller that would come over from Knoxville and he worked with Big John Tate in our gym. And some other people, notable names, uh, Olympic medalists, I mean. Uh, all right, I'm going around the block here, but uh, the at the time, it moved to another part of the state and then moved down to Atlanta, Georgia, uh, TV tapings, but the TV tapings took place in Charlotte, North Carolina, at the time I'm talking about. So this was for really a long time ago. Uh, there were not Gold's gyms all over the place. There were not many uh, weightlifting gyms you could go to, even in medium size and bigger cities. I mean, th there were, but you didn't have a uh, like a gym over here, a gym over here, a gym down here, a gym up here. You didn't have gyms all over the place like you do now. Today you can go somewhere, get upset, and then go on to another gym. Uh, back then you couldn't uh, because there were no other gyms. So <clears throat> they had to keep what they called K. What I found out later recently is K. Fabe, where the good guys stayed in there did their things together, and the bad guys did their things together. Uh, so they didn't want to want them out to be out in public, the good guys with the bad guys, or vice versa. So anyway, uh, these wrestlers would come into the boxing gym. Uh, there was weight equipment, if you want to call it that. It wasn't a Nautilus, but there were... Uh, pulley systems that used to be attached to the walls and people would use that I'm not even sure if I'm sure Nautilus equipment and these weight machines were around but they weren't everywhere and they were not heard of at, at the time I'm talking about maybe specifically in New York City LA and places like that uh, where bodybuilding was very huge, uh, but not at normal gyms. You had free weights, uh, you had cables, you had, it, it is way different than it is today. So anyway, the, uh, the wrestlers would come in and they would go over to the workout area away from the ring and uh, there's a little corner in there and they'd bench press and these dudes were strong. I mean, they were real strong. But what I want to relate to the younger people is especially, and any of you older people, and if you're in boxing, 
tell this story. Say, hey, I heard this old man talking about this. Because it seemed to be the same way today. Bar none. It would be the same way today. These, these guys would come in. And all these stories that we hear about today. These guys were the guys coming in the boxing gym. A lot of these guys. That you hear, oh my God, they were so tough. And they'd yank your eyeball out. They'd, uh, uh, one of them hit uh, John Matuzak in the mouth and dropped him. And uh, that guy came in right now. John Matuzak was a big, big football player. I believe maybe he would have been playing for Florida State at the time they mentioned the story. And this Pretty tough guy, I think it was Dick Slater, uh, punched him and knocked the kid out. But what they don't want to tell you is the kid was 18 and a half years old then. Back then, you could go into a bar when you were 18. But he was still a kid. He's still a baby, just off to college to play football. Later in life, that wouldn't have happened. John Matuzak would have killed him, would have ripped his head off. But you hear all these stories. And these wrestlers like to pat themselves on the back. They're the hardest workers. They're the toughest guys. Uh, well, in my experience, when they came into the boxing gym, uh, they were told, don't start no shit in here. Well, how do you know that? Because the first day I was in the boxing gym, and a group of them came in, and I'm going to tell you who was in the group. Uh the old man said, you guys stay over there and don't start no effing shit up in here. You're going to get to, you're going to get your ass kicked. Turns around, tells us, I have to remind these guys, uh, it's just a friendly reminder. You guys stay away from them. And the reason being is, uh, The people that had the boxing gyms, when the wrestlers would come in, you'd have to make sure because these guys would get into character and would not hop out of character. And they would think they were as, as bad and as tough as the TV character and the acrobat work they did inside the rings in a coliseum or on TV tapings. Uh, they'd, they'd come in there in character. And they'd have to be gotten in line real quick. Well, why would you have to do that? Were they scared for the boxers? No. None in the least bit. They were scared for their liability that one of the boxers might half kill or kill one of these wrestlers. Uh... So let's talk about who came, who who came in at different times, all right? Uh, but these boxers knew they dropped the attitude anyway. Now they were like, "This ain't fantasy land here," and it wasn't like there was ten world champions in the gym. It's just average. I was one of them. Of course, I was a kid, but these guys were just club boxers. But these wrestlers knew, don't mess around with these guys. You, you, you'll get your head bashed in. They knew it. Now, there's going to be some wise and hammers. They know jujitsu. They'd be able to get you in a clutch and uh, get the fuck out of here with that. Uh, I'm not even going to open up to go in that area with you. Maybe one day I'll put a video up. Easily showing people how not to get grabbed a hold of. Uh, it's not a complicated, huge process. And we're going to go on and we're going to talk about Joe Rogan in a minute. Uh, some crap he, he has said. Uh, Ricky Steamboat. You would know him as Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. He wasn't known as the Dragon back then. He was just Ricky Steamboat. Uh, Rick Flair, 
uh, Greg the Hammer Valentine. He was uh, referred to as Greg the Hammer Valentine. Ric Flair was the nature boy then. Uh, Ric Flair had probably became known as the nature boy as a character name two years prior to us seeing him in the gym. Uh, now, these guys came in at different times. Uh, the, the, the good guys would come in, and then you'd have a rotation, and then maybe a month or a week later, maybe the next day, the bad guys would come in. So they kept part. One time they didn't, but I'm not going to go into the story because it was just a couple of them. Uh, Jimmy Superfly Snooker, I'll go ahead and tell you the story. He and Ricky Steamboat were uh, getting bodybuilding for the Mr. Charlotte competition, and they both came in together. And well, I uh, we you know they were uh, anything. I don't think anything was said, but I think one of the older ki- older men had actually told me. No, they don't like each other, but they're putting all their differences aside uh, and helping each other for the Mr. Charlotte uh, competition. Uh, They've separated their uh, wrestling from life for the contest. It was presented to me in that type of way. Uh, So there there were some breaks uh, in there. Um, Yeah. Paul Jones uh, came in. Um, I'm just trying to... I said Baron Von Reisky. He was a German character. And oddly enough, his true life, real wife, was a substitute teacher uh, that would come in three, four, eight times a year and teach one of my classes. Uh, Sweet lady. But she would... Uh, tell us y'all treat substitutes bad y'all don't do what we tell you go crazy and my husband's Baron Von Reisky and if I have to call him down here I'll leave and go to the principal's office and call him he's at the house right now 15 minutes from here he'll come and that did scare us uh, a, a lot of other guys uh, Wahoo McDaniel um and there are other guys, if I sat around and tried to think about it, I'd, I'd come up with 20 more names uh, of, of people that if you go look, you'd see, if you're younger and didn't live them, you'd see they're very famous wrestlers. But there was no comparison there. These guys were big. Uh, you, would, you know, if you were an average guy, you wouldn't want to go out on the street and start a fight with any of them. But... Uh, uh, and there were other reasons that I'll go into in another video of separation. Uh, they also didn't want these wrestlers to get around kids. None of us. And you don't have to set much of your imagination to work to figure out why. If you just look around today at what's going on with the... Uh, Vince McMahon, and I'm telling you, it's riddled all through wrestling. Uh, they've look. This another thing. I'm just gonna go ahead and go into uh, boxing. Uh, a lot of your MMA, uh, NFL, your your hard combat and your hard contact sports have not been overtaken by this, but your Play sports, your entertainment purposes sports. There has always been in male sport of those sports a huge homosexual and pedo folks in those environments. Uh, you it broke our heart as kids to up and realize and I and I'll tell you this this little story. Uh I forget the guy's name 
God, I just forget everything. Uh, you had Arnold Schwarzenegger here, and then you had another guy. He was a black guy. He shaved his head bald. But two of the Mr. Olympia contests, we all looked at, and, and we knew it was Sergio Oliva was, was what his name is. I may be pronouncing that wrong. Ser, Sergio Oliva, Olive. Sergio Alive, I believe. That's how you'd pronounce it. Uh, the gays who were in control of the bodybuilding gave it to Arnold Schwarzenegger because he was a very handsome guy. And he was appealing to them. Favors were exchanged. He was one of the ball players. Sergio wasn't a very handsome guy. But he was ten times the bodybuilder than Arnold Schwarzenegger was. Maybe he wasn't playing ball. I don't. I. I don't know. Uh, but I know that Arnold Schwarzenegger won these things when he shouldn't have won them, and then he went on and got the Hollywood career. Isn't that amazing? Does that sound kind of uh, todayish to you? See. Um, there's hundreds of more things I could talk about here with concerns to that that type of stuff, but I'm not going to do it. Uh, so I, ju I just today, you kids, you see all this wrestling on the internet. Uh, you guys and older people, uh, all of us get to sit and listen to these old-time wrestlers tell their stories. And even a professional boxer that uh, uh, fought Anthony Joshua in the past recent years put on a, something at a 5 or 10 of the really the toughest wrestlers. And I'm sitting there while this Englishman's going down this list, and I'm like... They ain't a damn guy you've mentioned on this list. It's really tough. They might have been tough to other wrestlers, but out here in the real world, in the fight game, not tough at all. Uh, so a lot of you, you, uh, you hear people saying, in the 50s wrestling was real, but in the 50s wrestling wasn't real. In the 40s wrestling was real. As soon as television came about and they put it on, uh, there was nothing real about it. And the carnival things before then, they would generally pick a big guy out, give him $20, $10, $5. Money was money back then. And they'd say, come in here and take our carnival worker on, but you need to lose within this amount of time. And they'd do it. It's always been a fix. Never nothing real in it. And somebody tells you that, they're a damn fool. Have there been real fights that have broke out in wrestling matches? Or maybe somebody hit somebody. Maybe somebody wasn't selling the shots that they were giving to them. Maybe this, maybe that. Yeah, there have been. Uh, but on the whole and in general and all that, nothing uh, real about this crap at all. Now, they uh, today... They don't travel quite as much. They're at home a lot more. Uh, you have the advent of steroids that, that were about when I was a kid, but uh, not to the way they are now or were in the 80s or the 90s and, and such. Uh, uh, you know, an amazing thing about something happened after the 70s. When the 80s became, came along, it was like a big indulgent in, indulgence in things. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to achieve this thing right here, to get all this stuff right here. And steroids started going around all these gyms and stuff. And uh, I've seen it thousands of times. And I'll be like shaking my head. So, two guys that come out the bathroom and they give each other shots or one's giving another one a shot. And you just sit there and you go, oh my gosh. And what goes through my head is, you effing losers. 
you insecure, pathetic pipsqueaks, uh, no matter how big and strong they are. You know, that's what I see. I see the inside of it. Uh, but I don't know. I think most people my age or older than me, I don't know about 10 years younger or younger than that, than me. But I would wager, I'd wager to bet most of the guys within a few years are the same age as me, maybe five or ten years older, uh, that you boxed uh, at any moment in your life, any time in your life, that being in the gym and being around these guys, you became able to be a heart spotter. That is, you can already see what's in the guy's heart. You, it will take you, uh, you don't have to watch the guy train. You can talk to the guy for five minutes. You can a lot of get time, you can just look at the person and size them up. And you say, when push comes to shove, this guy don't have the heart. Uh, when he starts getting, getting bashed, uh, he's going to take a knee. Uh, he gets knocked down, and he could have got up. He's not going to get up. He's going to sit there and play play knocked out, play dead. And uh, uh, I see it today uh, all the time, especially on television, especially when uh, uh, you know I hear these boxers, oh, this guy's so great. And I'm like, well, wait till he runs up on this one or that one. And it's... Like I've read the book, and the book always is the science, and the uh, science is not science falsely so called. It's real science, and when you look and you see that you pick up on these little indicators, and you say, this guy's not he's not got the heart when you know he's doing great around this gym. Uh, he's top dog up in here. But as soon as he goes out there to Gym X or Gym C or Gym B uh, and runs up on somebody that can take it and dish it back out at him, he's going to fold. And that's the biggest surprise to folks. Uh but I'm, I've been pretty good at being able to spot that. And I get surprised, too. A lot of times I look at a fella and say, this cat, you know, uh, he might not have the fastest hands. He, you know, he, he might not hit the hardest, but he's got a lot of heart. And I get that kid up there and, you know, I, you know takes a body shot and quits. You know, so you don't, you, none of us ever know, but, in my case, a lot of times, like I read the book, and the book is real science. And when I sit there and I tell you, this kid's not going to have the heart. He's uh, trains good. It's good to have him in the gym. It's good to have him light or medium sparring, but this kid has no heart. He's got no future. Uh, and the sad thing is, typically, it's the fastest guy. Typically, it's the hardest hitting guy you run across, and the scariest guy, and then you you just see it. You just see it. You feel it. It's a maybe a vibrational, an invisible vibrational thing, and you pick up on it. Um, but that's the majority of the wrestlers. I mean, uh, you. Uh, with fist allowed, with fist allowed, uh, you can take the best, all these professional wrestlers, and I, I, it's hard to get a hold of somebody that pounds your, pounds your face in, you know, and that doesn't get talked about very much. Uh, Oh, this guy will grapple you, he'll turn you around, he'll blah, 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 blah. I hear this stuff about the hearts. Oh, it's too hard, the weirdo that talk like this. He'll take you in the dungeon, which is the basement of his house, and he'd stretch you. Uh, those guys that went in there with that old weirdo were forced to be stretched. Uh, 
he was the promoter, Stu Hart was, and that's uh, the Hart wrestlers, their daddy. And uh, it's, it's just everything's like almost like an illusion. So I guess this video really is be careful what you think you're seeing, and that's going to be the theme of the rest of the year with us. Be careful what you think you are seeing. Be careful who, what you're listening to. If 98% of the crowd over here is over here and they're all saying the same thing, chances are there's 2% of the people that are going against the grain. And when you just start adding it up and adding it up, the 2% have as a good a bet, betting average or batting average, as you want to call it, as the 98% over here that are in in concert together, one voice. Uh, 2% are probably right more than the 98%. So, uh, young boxers, uh, even oh, the Bruce Lee thing. Yeah, this is going to be a long video. Uh, for those of you that can hang on, there's a lot of people that like my voice, and I help. I can just put them to sleep listening to me. So that's a good thing. Hope my voice shows up good on this microphone thing. Uh, Joe Rogan, Gene LaBelle, Gene LaBelle, Gene LaBelle, Gene LaBelle beat up Bruce Lee. Uh, Steven Seagal got beat up by Gene LaBelle. Uh, Steven Seagal pooped his pants because Gene LaBelle got him in a headlock. Gene LaBelle picked uh, Bruce Lee up and firemen carried him and threw him on the floor. You know what, people? Get the F out the back. Uh, I... I I studied or took or whatever you want to call it Taekwondo uh, through my younger formidable years right along with boxing uh, there is no comparison uh, let's let's start with Gene LaBelle I'm gonna get to Bruce let's start with Bruce Lee you know, they asked Bruce Lee because Bruce Lee was living and uh, Muhammad Ali was champion, uh, heavyweight box champion. Could you beat Muhammad Ali? No, I could not beat this guy. You see the size of his fist. The size of his fist would per not permit me to beat him. What the hell? Muhammad Ali at 220 pounds. Weighed a hundred pounds more than this Bruce Lee guy. Uh, Bruce Lee wasn't no more much better than watching professional wrestling on the television. Uh, you've seen these, boom, these six inch punch, and these people going down in these chairs. And so, that, uh, no, 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 no. I'd stand. There's no way that guy could do. Could have. Maybe he could now if he's in his 20s or 30s, and me being as old as I am. But you take somebody like Joe, uh, you know, big strong boy, big strong man, and get them to stand there and think Bruce Lee's gonna stick a six-inch punch and have them flying back in a chair and going across the uh, auditorium floor. Grow up. Grow up. That's for those of you that's never gotten a fight before. Because you, know, you don't understand it. So you look and say, oh. now Get out here and get in the real world and get in a knockdown drag out and see how it works. It don't work like Bruce Lee. Uh, now, am I taking away from Bruce Lee? No. No, no. Uh, great in the martial arts. Great in the movies. Wonderful guy. I'm sure. I don't know. Could have been a bad guy, but uh, kudos to him. Uh, you know, he was a Chinaman that made good in America. 
when that wasn't a big thing to happen in America. I mean, he's a phenomenal guy just for that alone. Uh, racist. <laughs> Guilty. As Peter, as he was saying, family guy. Look. I don't think Gene LaBelle, uh, who was a stuntman and a jiu-jitsu guy that uh, uh, Joe Rogan loves to death, uh, and good for Joe Rogan, and I'm not pulling Gene LaBelle down. Gene LaBelle is a pretty tough guy, but he was a stunt guy, and he wasn't a big fighter. And, and let's talk big fighters to martial arts to those times. Go watch a taekwondo contest. Go watch a jiu-jitsu contest or whatever they call it. They're not fights. Go watch a kung fu contest. Go watch a karate contest. Hit, score, heap. Hit the shoulder, stop, reset. That ain't fighting. That ain't fighting. And uh, a lot of people look to Joe Rogan as an authority on fighting. And uh, that damn guy ain't no fighter. I hate to break it to you. He's no fighter. Uh, go watch him kick and do his little things and his little spiels. Uh it's no fighter. He's getting older, so maybe that's why. I don't know. Uh, there's no comparison with MMA, uh, kickboxing, Muay Thai, uh, boxing, over to this play shit, this choreographed play shit. And any of you that have took Taekwondo, if you've took it, from a reputable thing. You got little choreographed movements that you go through. You get through that, maybe you got four of them, and then you get a belt up when you can do those reasonably fast and without mistake. Then they give you two or four or more. And as soon as you can choreograph all that together, you move up. Uh, you, you can't choreograph a fist fight. And you're not getting anybody down in the figure four leg hold uh, if they are pounding you in your face and keeping you from grabbing them down low. Uh, and the quickest way to get your ass knocked out is to lunge forward, bending your head down, trying to go low on another fella. You're going to get hurt. Uh, if... if uh, uh, no offense to MMA guys. I, 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 no offense. But if MMA guys were better strikers, uh, you would rarely have anybody be taken down. Rarely. Because as soon as a guy would lunge in, you just pound him. And trust me, if you can hit reasonably hard, you hit somebody right here on their ear, you're going to cause problems for them. And then you just beat them up. You let them go down. Then you get on top of them. And you don't have to worry about all this jujitsu bullshit. Uh, I'm not saying the stuff's not effective. Uh, uh, it is effective. You get somebody down. You twist them up into a pretzel. Start breaking limbs. It's deadly. You can kill somebody. Uh, but the problem is... You're going to have to be one big, bad, tough dude to get by a striker. And you don't hear nobody talking in defense of the people that strike good and anymore. And that's a cotton-picking shame. So, uh, that's my statement on that. Going over to the Tai Chi guy, I guess it was Tai Chi, Steven Seagal. Uh, I don't give him no credit either, but it seems like everybody picks on him. But as far as it goes down the neighborhood of this martial art stuff, uh, 
Steven Seagal is not such a huge leap step down from Gene LaBelle or Muhammad uh, Bruce Lee. So, I know a lot of you, you're just so brainwashed, you can't understand. And, uh, you know, I've talked to people over the years, they're like, if you, uh, you know, you sit there and you tell them, uh, a pistol could stop Bruce Lee quite easily. Oh, no. Because if you were, uh, as long as he was within 30 foot of you, he'd get to you before you hit him with a bullet. Because he'd move. He's faster than a bullet. Faster than a trigger finger. I'm like, grow up, people. So, anyway, that's my rant going into this weekend. And it was a long one. Uh, you know who you are if you needed a comfortable nap later on. I know you're in you're in camp to fight. Uh, know it's all serious. If just listening to my voice and listening to this long drawn out story helps you in this training camp, this video was meant for you, sir. It was meant specifically for you. And whatever my voice or what I talk about that gives a common effect to you, I hope this one has ten times the calming effect for you. And uh, all you got to do is say something, and I'll, I'll make a... If you, however many weeks you got I'll make one a day for you and I'll make them around 50 minutes like this one is uh, cause I can talk uh, I can talk a lot uh, to the rest of you thank you so much for getting this far uh, much love to you remember uh, Christ rose Christ won he defeated death. He defeated hell. So get on that team. The king of all kings. The prince of all princes. The only one true God. Get over there with the real Christ. Uh, and go home. And come home with the rest of us. Uh, because there is a beautiful eternity waiting for everyone that believes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. So, blessings, and we hope everybody has a wonderful Easter Sunday tomorrow.